We are in Daniel chapter 9 still. If you want to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, as I said before, put a bookmark in there because we're going to be there for quite some time. Uh, those of you with Pew Bibles, I don't know the page, 868, 90, something like that. 884. All right, 884. So throughout the Bible, there's all sorts of examples of prayer that we can learn from, not so much as, as a tutorial of prayer, but an illustration or an example of prayer. And we're looking at Daniel 9 in that regard. Of course, there's also the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. Uh, last week I read Paul's prayer t for his people in Ephesians 3. And of course, in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel is Hannah's prayer of praise when her son Samuel was born. And we read in our responsive reading this morning a prayer of Daniel in Psalm 51 that he prayed as a psalm of repentance after he had defiled the wedding bed or marriage bed of Uriah and Bathsheba. Throughout scripture we find commandments to pray but rather than looking at it as a commandment to be obedient to, we need to look at it as a privilege. That we as believers, as those that have been brought into the family of God through the shedding of Christ's blood and our submission to Jesus as Lord of our lives, we are part of the family. We have this privilege to enter the throne room. And even when we know that we have that privilege, so often we fail to pray. And again, it gets back to that theory. Christians don't pray because they're afraid God will not answer their prayers. They've had instances before where they've prayed and God has not answered the prayers. And so he says, well, maybe he's not there. So we get in a crisis of faith. Jesus' brother James wrote in his letter, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So we may not be praying right if we're not getting our prayers answered. But Jesus promised in John's gospel when he said, I and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Sometimes it doesn't happen. And so we want our prayers to be effective, meaning that God hears them and God answers them. And again, Daniel chapter 9, these first 20 ch verses are an example of an effective prayer because what we see in verse 21, Gabriel shows up. And so we saw last week that um, the first two characteristics of effective prayer in this passage is that first of all, it's in harmony with God's word. And all prayer is in agreement with, in harmony with, and in response to God's word. And so a stumbling block to effective prayer is not listening to what God is telling us through the reading of his word. To that which he wants us to know about him and what he wants us to know of his will. Secondly, effective prayer is grounded in the will of God. John in his letter that we saw just earlier this year wrote, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he answers, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. And we tend to think of our prayer life, we tend to pray for things that are temporal, meaning of this world. We do not have an eternal vision in our lives. 
And so we get into what Paul wrote to the Romans, that, that great passage, Romans 8:28. It says, "And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose." And so we read that and we think, oh, all things work for my good? Where's that cancer diagnosis fit in there? Where's that car accident fit in? Where's that broken marriage of a child fit in? And we just think of a temporal situation. We do not think how it will allow us to grow for eternal benefit. So we need to understand that prayer is not to bend God's will to ours, but to conform ours to his. Before we get into what we're, new stuff we're looking at this week, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the gift of your word. We pray as we examine it that your spirit be among us. Guide us in understanding and Father, we pray for the one in the pulpit today. You'd forgive him his sins. They are many. Remind us all that we are here to draw near to Jesus and him only. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So not only is effective prayer in harmony with God's word, grounded in the will of God, it is effective prayer is intentional is intentional. Look at verse 3 in chapter 9. Daniel writes, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded him with him in prayer and petition and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So I turned to the Lord. And it's not necessarily meaning that he faced Jerusalem, even though according to chapter 6, that was his practice to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. But it means he turned his attention to that he, he was focused on God. It was an intentional, it was intense, and it may be described as fervent prayer. And then we see that in fastings and in sackcloth and ashes. This means that Daniel took a position of mourning and of repentance. If you remember a few years ago, we studied the book of Esther, the story of Esther, and Haman had endangered all the Jews by um, making it open season for them on a particular day. And when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city and wept loudly and bitterly. Sackcloth and ashes were a sense of repentance of mourning and then later in the same story Esther when she decides to go to the king which might result in her death said go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me do not eat or drink for three days night or day and I and my maids will fast also when this is done I will go to the king so there's this fasting idea this going without food. And, and there's two aspects of that. There is the physical aspect, the emotional aspect, that when there's a crisis in our lives, very often we lose the will to eat. We lose a loved one. You always got people coming up to you, eat something, you'll feel better. It's because we don't, we can't even think about preparing eating a meal, let alone having to prepare it. And that's where all those covered dishes come in handy. But other times, fasting can be spiritually beneficial. And that's basically a theology of setting your priorities. We're given the opportunity to express ourselves in an undivided and intense devotion to the Lord and to the concerns of spiritual life. And it means abstaining for a short time from normal and good things, such as food or drink or television or Facebook or social media. It provides an uninterrupted time of focus. 
but should not be a burden or seem like a duty. And Jesus had instructions about fasting. We look in Matthew 6, 16. Jesus said, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Daniel was intentional. He took actions that showed or exhibited his intent to communicate with God. I'm making this decision. I'm, I'm turning my face towards you. And so our prayer life as well should be intentional. So how do we, how do we make our prayer lives intentional? And the first one is to set aside a time daily to read your Bible and pray about what you've read. And start small. There are some people that will open the Bible and say, I'm going to start at Genesis and read all the way through. And it goes pretty good through Genesis, Exodus. Deuteronomy gets a little squirrely. Leviticus is a little tough. But by the time you get to Numbers, you go, I can't keep all this square, this straight. So I'd suggest starting in the Gospels. Turn to the last portion of the book and start reading there. And then as you get more questions, go back. I've got a friend in De Caloris Ministries that said, you know, there's a certain, several times a day that I'm sitting in a small room taking care of some other business that I can read. Everybody sits in a small room, taking care of business, time when they can read. You've got the time. Another thing we may try to do is make a prayer list. Gee, what do you know, it's right here in our bulletin. Make a list, bring this home, pray about these things. Be intentional in our prayer. Another thing may be a prayer journal. I've started and I'm stopped and I started and I'm stopped. But you can write down what you pray about, put a date on it, and keep going. And then, you know, turn back every once in a while a few pages. See what you prayed about a month ago. Oh my goodness, God answered that prayer yesterday. It can be encouraging and it's intentional in our prayers. Making God a priority in our lives, communicating with God a priority in life. So prayer, effective prayer starts with being in harmony with God's word. It's grounded in the will of God. It's intentional and is also, also strengthened in confession. Daniel was devout in his understanding of Scripture, and I'm certain he knew of Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. Now remember, Daniel's in exile. Deuteronomy's written 1400 B.C., Daniel's around 600 B.C., God's telling them they're going to be dispersed. And you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today. Then the Lord God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. So look at verse 4, Daniel verse 4. I prayed to the Lord God, Lord my God, and confessed Effective prayer contains confession. Verse, then go to verse 5. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from our, your commands and laws. Verse 6. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. 
who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Verse seven, the end of the men of Judah and people of Jerusalem, all of Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. Skip down to 10, we've not obeyed the Lord our God and kept the laws he gave us. Verse 11, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. And it's not all the verses in there that cover the confession. It just got to a point I was getting a little depressed reading all that. And so confession is part of effective prayer. It's also necessary for our Christian walk. Confession and repentance are fundamental to our relationship to God through Jesus. So many times, modern evangelical practice is to tell people, well, just ask Jesus in your heart. Ask Jesus to be your Savior or accept Jesus as your Savior. When in fact, it is our job to, first of all, we learned from our lessons in Mark that we have to repent and believe. That's the steps, repent and believe. Jesus gave us some hint of that in Luke's gospel when he said two men went up to the temple to pray and one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Remember this story? The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He'd not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. When John the Baptist came into the, from the desert in Mark's gospel, he said, or the Bible, the Mark has written, and so John came, baptized him in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Again, confession and repentance are necessary for the forgiveness of sins and the restoration of a relationship with God. I wanna remind you, there's only two requirements of becoming a Christian, right? It's repent of your sin, and submit to Jesus as your Lord. Jesus is Lord because he is God incarnate. If God is in charge, God is sovereign, God is in, char uh, in control, then we submit to his authority. If you recall in Mark, one of the lawyers, an expert in the law came up to him and said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, the most important one is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Effective prayer requires repentance and confession. The point here is, you know, you can't keep a secret from God, right? He already knows. He already knows. Might as well confess it. Not as though he's ever going to be surprised. I can't believe Andy did that. There's no sweat on his upper lip. And then when you realize after that confession that he still loves you, he still continues to love you. In spite of that sin, you come to love him more. And once you love him, then you have the desire to be obedient. And of the speaking of obedience, one of the commands Jesus made during this Last Supper is that of the Lord's table. 